2 Timothy chapter 2, we've been in this uh, series now on the judgment seat, and we've been in the faithful saying and for a while now, but this is, I, I can't impress upon you enough why this is, this is a, an important study, okay? Um, to get these things right and to teach them in a way that, that, that they're clear and that people can understand what we've been looking at. Let's read, just read the three verses, then we'll have a word of prayer to begin. Verse 11, it is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Dear Holy Father, we thank you once again for your word. And uh, we just pray this morning that as we come to it, to, to, to read it, to study it, to see what it has to say to us, that we'll have hearts and minds that are receptive and attentive to your word, that we'll be those that would seek to be doers of the word, to understand the word, and put it into practice in the details of our lives. Not just understand it intellectually, not just understand it in a way that we can play mental gymnastics with your word and, and philosophize about it and so forth, but that we can know it and live it in the details of our life. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So we've been in the faithful saying, and I've suggested to you way back now a few weeks ago, that all four of these if-we statements in these verses are statements of fact, not statements of condition. We've gone over that in detail. I've laid that out for you in an overview, and we've gone over that with each one of these. We have now gotten to a point where we've studied the first two, and so I want to direct your attention this morning to the second half of verse 12. Now, just very briefly, last Sunday we finished that first half of the verse. Look at verse 12. If we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. And what we saw last Sunday is that it's important to note the, the tense uh, in the verbs here, uh, since it's true that we suffer now, look at verse 12, if we suffer, that's present tense, we shall also reign with Him, that's future tense. And so you, you, you have to pay attention to that when you're looking at this. So what we saw last Sunday is that since it's true that we suffer now, it is equally true that we will reign with Him in the future. And since all believers suffer, all believers will reign with the Lord Jesus Christ. We went over that in detail, went through the passages in Colossians and in Ephesians and other places in the Pauline Scriptures where he's talking about the structures of governmental authority in heaven and earth and so forth, and how Christ has been made head over all those things to the church. And so I said to you last Sunday that just as it is a fact that we suffer now, it is equally a fact that we shall also reign with Him. It, it, it's, it's a fact. All members of the body of Christ will reign with Christ. I added the all caps statement there because I think it's important to be clear about it. God's purpose in forming the church, the body of Christ, was to create an agency that He would use to repossess the governmental structures of the heavenly places back to Himself. And it is not possible to be a member of the body of Christ and not reign with Christ because of the reason and the purpose for which that body was created by the Lord Jesus Christ. And we studied that all in Ephesians 1.21, that all of the, the principalities, the powers, uh, and so forth, and even every name that is named, that those are all talking about positions of authority in the heavenly government that members of the church, the body of Christ, will occupy as we reign with Christ. Now, I further said to you, that the judgment seat of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ is about determining each believer's capacity for service and the specific role in the heavenly government that you will have, that I will have, but all believers will reign with Christ as a matter of fact according to the first half of verse 12. Okay. Now, as we begin to switch now to the second half for this morning's study, I want to point out a couple things. Look with me at, let's read verses 11 and 12 together again. Verse 11, it is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. So I have a question. I pointed this out to you a few weeks ago when, we, when I was beginning to introduce these things. When you read the first half of verse 12, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him, do you go back to the first if statement at the end of verse 11 to inform how you understand the first statement in verse 12, or do you read both of those statements as independent statements of fact? Okay, So let me show you what I'm saying. Verse 11, it is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. Is that true? Yes, that's absolutely true. 
Notice that, that after that phrase, you have a colon, right? And then you get into verse 12, and it says, If we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. So when I... In other words, when I want to understand verse, the first half of verse 12, when it says, if we suffer, we shall also reign with Him, do I, do I need to go back to the first statement at the end of verse 11 to inform me on how I should understand the, the first statement in the beginning of verse 12, or do I understand the end of verse 11 and the beginning of verse 12 as both being independent statements of what? Fact. Everybody understand what I'm saying to you? Okay. So it would be inconsistent then to come to the second half of verse 12. Look at it with me again. Verse 12, if we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. Colon, if we deny Him, He also will deny us. So if I, if my point is this, just in the natural reading of that in English, if I do not do that, if I don't go back to verse 11 to help me understand how I should read this first half of verse 12, then why would I take the second half of verse 12 and look back to the first half of verse 12 to inform how I should read that? So my point is this. There are some that would read that verse as follows. Okay? So, if we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. If we deny Him, He also will deny us. And what they want to do is they want to run those two statements together in verse 12, and so what they do is they, they explain it the following. Okay? If we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. So, they first notice that when they do this, they are reading it as a statement of condition, not a statement of fact. So, if we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. If we deny Him, He also will deny us. So then, the way it's explained then is the following. Well, if we deny Him, what are you denying Him? You're denying Him in suffering. In the, in the first half of the verse, then He will deny us. So then, what you're being denied in the second half of the verse is a reign with Christ because you're not what? You're not suffering, okay? And my point to you as we get started is two points. Number one, again, these are independent grammatical structures of fact, and to read verse 12 in this way is not in line or is inconsistent with how you read, verse, or how you read if statement number one into the beginning of verse 12. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? Okay? So you have, you have two phenomenon going on here. The first one is an inconsistent reading in English, and the second one is a failure to recognize that these are all statements of fact, not statements of condition. Okay? Now, grammatically, just very fast, grammatically this portion of the verse is also a first-class condition. That's if and it's true i.e. the fact stating use of the word if. So look at the structure here. <clears throat> you have, you have the, the condition if, followed by the indicative mood on the verb we deny, thereby indicating to you that this is a first class condition. This is, a, this is an if and it's true. This is not maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Okay. So again, all of these three that we've looked at so far have exhibited the exact same grammatical structure and they are all punctuated in English in exactly the same manner, except at the end of verse 13, at the end of the sentence, where you have a period. Okay? Excuse me. <clears throat> so, once again this morning, it is also important to note the tense on the verbs. Look at it again, verse 12. If we deny Him. Is that present tense or future tense there? That's present, okay? If we deny Him, He also will deny who? Deny us. Is that present or future tense? So the tenses on the verbs in the second half of the verse are exactly the same as they were in the first half, okay? So you have the same structure, same punctuation, same tense on the verb. So something is going to be occurring now if we deny Him. Something will occur out there. He will deny who? Us. Okay? Now, here's the thing. <clears throat> when understood, folks, as a statement of fact, when understood as a statement of fact, this, this portion of the faithful saying means that as believers, we will deny Him. You understand that? Okay. Now, I can already see some of you are squirming. Okay, because the, the first thing we've got to do, obviously, is identify what? 
What does it mean to deny him, right? Because if, if, if we're following the, the structure, and we have to interpret the verses based upon the facts that are before us, it's saying, if we deny, when it says, if we deny him, it means, if and you what? Will. Okay? If and you will. Okay? So, if, if understood as a statement of fact, this portion of the faithful saying means that as believers we will deny him. Now, on the surface, I can understand how this might make some saints uncomfortable, all right? However, to get started with this, I'm going to ask you some questions, and I want you to think about them honestly, okay? So we're thinking about these questions now from the point of view of if we deny him, and we what? And we will, okay? Question number one. Do you always, in every situation... Present your body a living sacrifice. You don't. don't I, you can. I'm just messing with you. Okay. the The answer is obviously what. Should you, as a believer, do that as your reasonable service according to Romans twelve one and two? Yes. Okay. So we we agree that we do not always in every situation present our bodies a living sacrifice. Okay. Question number two. Do you always, in every situation, allow yourself to be Christ's workmanship? If you said no for number one, you're probably going to say no for what? For number two. Okay? Question number three. Do you always, in every situation, walk in the Spirit and not after the flesh? No. Do you always have the indwelling Holy Spirit residing within you? giving you the capacity to choose to walk in the Spirit? Yes. But do we always, in every situation, make the choice to walk in the Spirit and not walk after the flesh? Listen, Jesus had to be at my house yesterday when I was moving some stuff and some of the words that were coming out of my mouth under my breath. Okay? Just, just being honest, okay? Fourth question. And they're not directed to the men that were helping me, by the way, okay? There, 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 there was a a beehive of children that were swarming the ramp that were, that were trying to move all the stuff on and were trying to get all the stuff on the truck and like every, all four of the boys that were there were all like right there on the ramp wanting to play on it while we're trying to move stuff, okay? So I may have, may have gotten a little annoyed with my children yesterday. Just saying. Question number four. Do you always, in every situation... Are you always, sorry, in every situation, careful to maintain good works according to Titus chapter 3, verse 13? Look, if you're honest, I would submit to you that you will answer all four of these questions as what? No. Okay? Now, if, 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 you, if you're not, if you don't answer them no, then, you know, you're, you're some uber, you know, super sanctified saint that never does anything wrong then, Right? Because as you and I both know in the details of our life, in any situation and circumstance, we have a choice to either walk in the flesh or walk in the Spirit, and, and so on. You understand the realities that these questions bring up. Now, 2 Timothy 2.12 says, if we deny Him. Look at it again. If we deny Him. Again, that is an indicative statement of fact. It means, if and you what? Will. Okay? Now, if you, can, if you admit, as I readily do, that I do not always do what these four uh, questions are, are, are asking or raising, then is it that hard for you to see that there may be the possibility that we do, in fact, deny Him in the details of our life from time to time? Okay? So let's study more about what this means. Okay? So, the, in order to understand this statement properly, we must gain understanding regarding what it means to deny Him which the verse asserts we will in fact do, okay? So, the Greek word translated deny here, the Greek word translated deny in verse 12 occurs 31 times in the New Testament. Of those 31 occurrences, the King James translators rendered the word in English as follows. Deny 29 times, and refuse two times, okay? So there's, there's two ways that the King James translators render this word in English. One of them I've highlighted for you there in, in Acts chapter 7. Hold your hand in here, come over to Acts chapter 7, look at verse 35, okay? You, you, I think you're probably more familiar with the, the concept of denying 
uh, maybe than you are refusing. But what you're going to find here is that they're synonyms. These words have similar meanings. They're, simon- they're synonyms for each other. Uh, the word deny and the word refuse. Uh, ro- uh, Acts chapter 7, look at verse 35. Acts 7, verse 35. This Moses whom they what? Refuse, saying, Who hath made thee a ruler and a judge? And uh, the same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel. Now think about that. When Israel refuses to follow Moses, what are they doing? Are they denying the authority that God gave Moses? Yes. So you can understand how the concept of to deny and to refuse are the same idea. Well, guess what? When you look them up in the dictionary, if you look up the words deny and the word refuse in the dictionary, Webster's 1828 dictionary, the word deny means to contradict, to gainsay, to declare a statement or position not to be true, to refuse. Interesting. To refuse, to grant as... Uh, look at, go to, drop down to, for the sake of time to number four. To disown, to refuse, to neglect, to acknowledge, not to confess. Okay? So does the dictionary tell me that to deny something, one of the meanings of deny is to refuse something? Okay? Now, if I look up the word refuse in the dictionary, guess what it tells me? Definition number one, to refuse. I'm sorry, to deny a, a request, demand, invitation, or command to decline, to do or grant what is uh, solicited, claimed, or commanded. So now I understand something, right? To deny and to refuse, are they, are they synonyms for each other? Okay? The verse says, go back to 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 12, halfway through the verse. <clears throat> if we deny Him. And again, that's not maybe you will, maybe you won't. That's if and you will deny him, okay? So we still have to look at this word deny. Come with me in order to do that. I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 26. Come over to Matthew chapter 26. Now I'm sure you, some of you probably know where I'm going with this already. Who is the most famous individual in the Scripture to ever deny the Lord? It's Peter, okay? So I want, to, I want to study this, and I want you to be thinking about this idea of denying Him, and what it means to deny Him in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. Look with me, start, at, start with me at verse uh, 34. So, Matthew chapter 26, verse 34. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, he's talking to Peter in verse 33, that this night, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Thou shalt deny me thrice. Now, in the sake of fairness, I want to point out that there is a this, that the word deny here is a different word in Greek, but it means the same thing. Okay, it means deny. It's it, it, like like it says here. So the Lord Jesus Christ tells Peter what? Look, Peter. This same night, before the roosters crowed three times, you're going to what? You're going to deny me how many times? Thrice. Okay. So before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Verse 35, Peter's reaction. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet I yet will I not what? Deny thee. Likewise also said the other what? So understand what's going on there in those two verses. The Lord tells Peter that before the night is out, he's going to deny him how many times? Three times. Peter's reaction in verse 35 is. No way, basically, I'd be willing to go and what? Die for you, and I'm certainly not going to do what? Deny you. And at this, t- at this point, the, past, the verse seems to indicate that the other apostles chime in and said, oh yeah, yeah, us too. Okay. Likewise said also all the disciples. Now, turn ahead with me to verse 69. Turn ahead with me to verse 69. So what does Jesus mean? When Jesus says, before we read that, what does Jesus mean when he makes this prediction to Peter regarding his denial? Okay, does, Is Jesus intending to say that, Peter, before the end of the night, you're going to lose your salvation? No. He's saying that before the night is out, he will deny him three times. Okay. So let's go down, if you would now, to verse... Uh, 
69. Now Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel came unto him, saying, Thou also wast with Jesus of Galilee. Verse 70. But he denied before them all, saying, Now watch this, I know not what thou sayest. Watch that carefully. He says there, he, does he say, I don't know who Jesus is? He says, I don't know what you're what? Talking about. Okay? Verse 71. And when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto, said unto them that were there, This fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. Now watch verse 72. And again he denied with an oath. I do not know the man. Now notice what Peter's doing here. The first time he says what? I don't know what you're talking about. Next person comes and says, hey, uh, weren't you with Jesus? And he goes, I swear to you that I do not know the man. So what's happening here to Peter's hard attitude here? Is it progressing is it escalating in terms of its rebellion, if you want to think of it in that way? Okay, verse, 70, verse 72, And again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. So the first time he just says, I don't know what you're talking about. The second time he adds that emphasis. You know, you question, I question a student, right? And they say, I didn't do it, Mr. Ross. Oh, really? Then why, why do you have the same answers that they have? I swear to God, Mr. Ross, I didn't do it. So... What are they doing? They're, they're, they're escalating it, and, and, and they're taking it a step further but using the, the, the wording to try to convince me that they didn't cheat, right? Well, that's, that's the same thing Peter's doing. Peter is escalating his use of words here to try to emphasize that he doesn't know Jesus. Verse 73, And after a while uh, came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou also art one of them, for thy speech betrayeth thee. Then began he to curse and swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew. Now not only do you have Peter's escalation here, he starts off saying, I don't know what you're talking about, then he goes, hey, I swear I don't know who he is. And then he starts cursing and swearing and carrying on and saying it in there in verse 74, I know not the man. And immediately after that happens, what occurs? The cock crows. Okay? Now, in the process of time, does Peter do exactly what the Lord foretold he would do? Okay? I.e., does Peter deny Christ? Okay? So when Peter denies Christ in verse 74, look at what it says. He says, I know not who. The man. So, when Peter denied that he knew the Lord, was he contradicting, gainsaying, and declaring the statements of his inquisitors to be false? Yes. What does the definition of deny say? I know I don't have the thing up there anymore, but it means to contradict, to gainsay, to declare a statement or a proposition not to be true. So what are they doing? They're saying, hey, you were with him too. And he's saying what? No. No, I wasn't. Not me. Next time, I swear to God, I don't know him. The next time, it's blah, 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 blankety, blank, blank, blank. I don't know him. Right? Okay? So when he's saying, when he is denying Christ, he is doing exactly what the definition says. He's contradicting, gainsaying, declaring a statement or proposition not to be true. In doing so, think about this, in doing so, he disowned any relationship with the Lord through his statement, I know not the man, thereby meeting the definition of what it means to deny. He's saying, I don't know who he is. Right? Now, so let's... So Peter denied, how did Peter deny the Lord? How did Peter deny the Lord? Peter denied the Lord through his conduct, not his doctrine. Was Peter running around saying, Jesus isn't God? 
No. Was Peter running around teaching false doctrine? No. How does Peter deny the Lord here in Matthew 26? He denies the Lord through his conduct and say, by, by the way he behaves himself and says, I don't know who he is. Peter is not out saying that you know Jesus isn't God and, and, all, and all sorts of crazy off-the-wall stuff about who the Lord is and so forth. Peter denies him through his conduct. When the time came for Peter to stand up for his faith in Christ, he chose the easy way out by denying that he knew the Lord. In short, folks, Peter denied Christ through his what? Through his works. Through his works. Now, when Peter does this, is Peter not a member of the kingdom church anymore? Is Peter not a member of the little flock anymore? No. Okay? Does Peter lose his salvation and his position in Israel as one that will reign on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of the nation of Israel here, because he denies the Lord? Or does what's going on here is Peter says one thing about who Christ is and what Christ means to him earlier on in the passage, and he says, I would even go die for you. It's not going to be me, Lord. I'm not going to deny you. And lo and behold, in the, in the crucible of the circumstances, when Peter is facing his inquisitors saying, aren't you one of those guys too? He says what? Not me. Okay? Now, how do members of the body of Christ, living during the dispensation of grace, deny Him in 2 Timothy 2.12? Well, come with me if you would over to Ephesians 2.10 first. Come over to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Before we do verse 10, just remind yourself of verse 9. Verse 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and then not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should what? How are you justified, saved, and made right with God? By your works, by your performance, or by, by grace through faith? Okay, so we know that from verses nine and 8 and 9, right? Now verse 10. For we, who's the we? The we are the ones that were saved by grace through faith in verse nine, verses 8 and 9, right? For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto what? Good works. Which God had before ordained that we should, that we should what? Walk in them. Okay? Now, this verse establishes the following realities for believers living in the current dispensation of grace. First, believers are Christ's workmanship, and they are created in Christ Jesus unto what? Good works. Okay? So you were justified in, your, in, in Christ justifying you by grace through faith. You became His workmanship. That, that was created in Christ Jesus unto what? Good works. Okay. Second, God has ordained for every member of Christ's body to walk in good works. How do you know that? Read the verse. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto what? So you're His workmanship, created in Christ unto good works. Read the second half. Which God hath before ordained that we might possibly, maybe, might want to think about walking in them. Is that what it says? No, it says that you what? Should walk in them. Okay? So Ephesians 2 makes clear that believers should walk in good works because we are created in Christ Jesus unto them. Furthermore, we are now Christ's workmanship. So let me put that for you another way. Put another way, the life of Christ working in the believer is now capable of producing good work that God can and will accept. Because it's not you doing it, it's who? It's Him in you doing it and producing it. Okay? Does everybody understand that? So we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, under good works, that we should walk in them. Now, with that being said, we deny Christ. We de now, you, who's, are you in Christ? 
Is Christ in you? Are you Christ's workmanship? Are you Christ's workmanship created on two good works that you should walk in them? Okay, we're, all, we're good with that, right? So what, what about when we don't do it? What about when we, in the power of our own flesh, or the rebellion of our own flesh, or in the thinking of our own fleshly mind, say, act and behave away in, in ways, in our thoughts, attitudes, and actions that are contrary to the life of Christ in us? Okay, are we still saved by grace through faith? Yes, but do we, when we function in that way, do we practically deny Him? Are we denying Him, the, are we denying the workmanship that He wants to do in us because we've been ordained and created under these good works that we should walk in them? So let me say it this way. We deny Christ when we sow to the flesh and thereby prevent the resident life of Christ, an opportunity to work in us. In short, we deny Christ by failing to walk in the Spirit and manifest the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Christ is denied in the believer's life by the believer failing to maintain good works. Does He want to be your workmanship? Does He want you to be His workmanship? Does He want to do a work in you and through you? And is He ordained that that's the way He wants it to be? Okay? Now, even though I'm saved through, by grace through faith, even though I'm justified, I'm a saint of the Most High God, I'm saved, I'm sealed, I'm seated in heavenly places, do I still reside in a body of flesh that has sin residing within it? So if I go out and sow to the flesh, am I denying the life of Christ to work in my, in my mortal flesh? Because I'm trying to do it how? My own way. My own thinking. My own understandings. And so forth. Come with me if you would to Titus chapter 3. I want you to consider... Now, while you're going there, stop in 2 Timothy. So make a pit stop in 2 Timothy on your way to Titus 3. Make a pit stop in 2 Timothy on your way to Titus 3. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Look at verse 11. He says, it is a faithful what? Okay, so we, are, we've, we've studied this before, right? A faithful saying is what kind of saying? It's a true saying, right? For it is a faithful saying, for if we be dead, we, for if we be dead with Him, we shall also live with Him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. If we deny Him, He also will deny us. So all those statements are true, right? Let's consider the wording of another faithful saying. Go to, go to Titus chapter 3, look at verse 8. Titus chapter 3, verse 8. This is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm how often? Constantly. Now watch this. That they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto who? Now notice a few things there. Number one, this is another faithful saying. Number two, does Paul say, look at it again, verse 8. Uh, these things I will that thou affirm how often? Constantly. Paul tells Titus that in his ministry there in the local church on Crete, that he needed to be constantly and continuing, continually reminding the believers of these things. What things? Verse 8, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain what? Good works. Okay? So, in the same context... Here in Titus chapter 3, in the same context, drop down to verse 14. And let others also learn to maintain good works for necessary what? Uses that they be not what? Unfruitful. Now he says verse 14 within the same context of what he said in verse 18, right? So, reading from my notes, in the same context, Titus chapter 3, verse 14 establishes the reality that good works in a believer's life are considered what? Fruit, okay? In contrast, believers who fail to maintain good works are, are called what in verse 14? Unfruitful, okay? Because 
because they are not behaving in a manner that is good and profitable unto men, i.e., they are not allowing the life of Christ to be made manifest in their mortal flesh. They are not allowing themselves to be Christ's what? Workmanship. Now, come with me to Titus chapter 1. Come with me to Titus chapter 1. <coughs> Titus chapter 1, for verse, uh, we'll start at verse 15. He says, unto the pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is what? Defiled. Now watch verse 16. They profess that they know God, but in works, they do what? How do they deny him? They deny him by the way they're what? By their works, by the way they're living. Okay, now think about what he's saying here in Titus. He just said in chapter 3, verse 8, he says, Hey, hey, Titus, you need to remind those people on Crete constantly, affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful. Got to have some care in this. Careful to do what? Maintain good works. You go to verse 14 and he says, Let others also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not what? Unfruitful. Then you come to chapter 1, verse 16, and he says, They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work what? Reprobate. Are you, the, as a believer, are you Christ's workmanship? As Christ's workmanship, were you created unto good works? Has God before ordained that you should walk in them? Does Paul instruct t Titus to constantly affirm people to maintain good works? Does he say in verse 14 that those who do are fruitful and those who do not are what? Unfruitful. And then you come to chapter 1, verse 16, and he says... Verse 16 again, they profess that they know God, but in works they what? Deny Him. Is it not ironic that earlier within the book of Titus, that the Apostle Paul clearly defines what it means to deny Christ? Paul speaks of those who profess that they know God, but deny Him through their works. Those who are reprobate concerning good works, are they fruitful or unfruitful? They're obviously unfruitful. Clearly, within the greater context of the book of Titus, one could only view believers who fall into this category as being unfruitful. In short, they are denying Christ by refusing to maintain good works. According to the Apostle Paul, believers can and do deny Christ through their works when they sow to the flesh and refuse to maintain good works. Everybody with that? Come with me, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 5. Come with me, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 5. <clears throat> 1 Timothy chapter 5, <coughs> verse 8. He's writing here. He says in verse 8, But if any man... Provide not for his own. Okay? And especially for those of his own house. He hath denied the faith and is worse than a what? You need to think about that verse. Why is a guy, how, how did the guy deny the faith in that verse? By running off into unsound doctrine and teaching? By, 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 by being swept away with false, with false doctrine? No, read the verse again. But if any man provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith. Men of the assembly, listen. You can have all of your doctrine right. 
You can dot every I, you can cross every T, you can have everything in your doctrinal understanding correct, but if you do not take care of and provide for the needs of your own household, the Apostle Paul says that you've denied the faith. Okay? So by refusing to do that, by refusing to take care of your wife, by refusing to take care of your children, by refusing to provide in a... Now look at a husband doing those things, is that what God would expect for the husband to do? Go read Ephesians chapter 5. That the husband should put as much care into seeing to the needs of his wife than he do, as he does into his own body. He that loveth his wife, loveth who? Himself. So now Paul's addressing a situation here where there are men in the assembly that come to church. Oh, isn't this the greatest doctrine ever? Oh, this is wonderful. We're under grace and we rightly divide and we know this and we know that. But they go home and they deny the faith by not providing for their families. Woo! Is that what the verse says? Paul speaks of believers who fail to provide for the needs of their own households as having denied the faith. But he doesn't stop there. Look at how the verse ends. It is worse than what? Folks, I didn't say this, God did. And you ladies, listen up. If you are married to somebody that will not take care of and provide for your needs, Paul says that that husband is worse than an infidel. He says he's worse than an unbeliever. Is that what it says? How would somebody in this situation deny the faith? Are they denying the faith by saying, I don't believe Christ died on the cross for my sins? Are they denying the faith by running off their Pentecostal confusion or, or some other denominational tradition or what have you? No. They deny the faith through their works. By the way they are behaving, operating, and functioning in their family. And Paul says, you behave this way, you've denied what? You've denied the faith. Not only have you denied the faith, he says at the end of the verse, but you are worse than an infidel. You are worse than the unbeliever. That's what he's saying. Back to my notes. By departing from the doctrine committed to... Uh, let me, so how does one deny the faith in 1 Timothy 5.8? Okay? By departing from the doctrine committed to the Apostle Paul? No. One denies the faith in this context through their conduct by refusing to provide for the needs of their own family. Consequently, it is possible for... Now think about this. It is possible for a saved member of the body of Christ to be spot on in terms of their doctrine, but deny the faith through their works by refusing to support their family. And folks, I don't take that to just mean money. Okay? As a husband and a father, I don't understand that to mean just money and materially. According to Paul, not only, has a, not only has such a believer denied the faith, but they are worse than an infidel, i.e. they are of worse moral character than the unbelievers that they ridicule. For me as a husband, to get up here and to teach this, and then to go into the details of my life with my family and my children and deny my kids food, deny my wife medical care and treatment, deny the basic necessities of life and deny them to their own, just turn them over to their own whims and wishes and be a complete absentee individual, for me to do that, I would be functioning in a way that is of worse moral character than the guy who just says, I don't believe in God. You understand that? <clears throat> Come back to 2 Timothy 2. Folks, what this means is, in other words, concerning good works, they're infidels, reprobates, and are denying Christ through their works. 
In summation, when believers walk according to a reprobate mind, sow to the flesh, and fail to maintain good works, they are denying Christ through their works. Now, I understand, I'm, I am using examples here from the point of view of a male husband and father as a member of the church, the body of Christ. Okay? Because I, it's more easy for me to do that, and it's probably more appropriate for me to do that than to get up here and say a bunch of stuff. But you ladies too, this applies to you too. Okay? You have responsibilities as wives and as mothers to your families and to your children. And for a mother and a, for a, mother and a, and a wife to completely just walk away and abandon those responsibilities would be the equivalent for the husband in this passage. Okay? Now, in summation, when believers walk according to a reprobate mind, sow to the flesh, and fail to maintain good works, they are denying Christ through their works. Believers <clears throat> who function in this fashion are in danger of being castaways at the judgment seat of Christ, for failing to keep their bodies under subject, for subjection and function properly in accordance with sound doctrine. Come back to Titus, or, sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 2. <clears throat> 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. For if we suffer, we shall also reign with him if we deny Him. See, the issue isn't maybe you will, maybe you won't. The issue is what? You will. Unless you answered in the affirmative to those first four questions I asked you at the beginning of the message, it is a fact as sure as you're sitting in there your seat and I'm standing here in front of you that all of us from time to time in the details of our lives have denied Christ through our conduct. Now, does that mean we lose our salvation? <clears throat> no. Verse 11. For it be, if we be dead with Him, we shall also what? True. If we suffer, we shall reign with Him. True. If we deny Him, He also will what? True. So if where would He deny you? What is the only place that you could be denied by the Lord Jesus Christ that we have studied, and the only place that you could be denied by Christ is denied a reward where? At the judgment seat. And remember, I labored for three weeks talking to you about principles of reward. Remember that reward is given on the basis of work. And that there is a difference between inheritance and what? Reward. It is a fact. I will readily admit it to you that when you study this out, every believer from time to time denies the Lord Jesus Christ through their what? Through their work. And we know from our study of the judgment seat Hold your hand there and go. Go back to 1 Corinthians 3. I'm running ahead of time anyway. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 3, verse 13. Every man's what? Every man's what? Now wait a minute. Stop. Ephesians 2.10. We're whose workmanship? Christ. Created in Christ Jesus unto what? Good works, which God before ordained that we should what? Titus chapter 3, verse 8, talks about how affirming constantly that the believer be that those who have believed in God should be uh, careful to maintain what? Those who do are fruitful. <clears throat> Man. Those who do are fruitful. Those who do not are what? How do believers deny Christ in the dispensation of grace? They deny Christ when we deny when we when we say to him, we will not allow ourselves to be your workmanship. We are going to do it our own way. We're going to do it based on our own thinking, our own wisdom, our own viewpoint, our own understanding and our own strength. 
And Christ is sitting there saying, won't you just let yourself be my workmanship, and you let me work it in you and through you, and you won't, there's no possible way that you will not be fruitful. But we think we know better, don't we? Even with all the understanding that we have about the Word of God rightly divided and who we are in Christ, far too many times as believers we try to take the wheel ourselves and do it on our own. And when we do, we deny Him. And He will also what? Deny you salvation? No. Deny you reward? Yes. So that principle, is it in line with everything else we studied about the judgment seat of Christ and how it works? Yes. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. What is the judgment seat of Christ doing again? It's declaring, manifesting, and revealing the quality of your what? Work. What are we in Christ? He is our... We, 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 thank you. We are His workmanship. Verse... 14, if any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive what? Reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer what? Folks, will there be loss and denial of reward at the judgment seat for those times, situations, and circumstances that we don't allow ourselves to be Christ's workmanship. Yes. Is there anything about what we've studied, go back to 2 Timothy, is there anything about 2 Timothy 2 that is in any way contrary or out of line when understood in this manner with what Paul says elsewhere in the Pauline Scriptures? No. 2 Timothy 2.12 if we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. If we deny Him, He also will deny us. Let me be clear again. You cannot be denied your salvation. But you can suffer loss and be denied in terms of what? Reward. Okay? Now, think about that, because we're... Well, I'll end with that. St. Timothy 2.12. So in accordance with this definition, what we've been looking at all hour. <clears throat> of what it means to deny Christ, it is a fact that believers deny Christ through our works. Yes. All believers have to make a choice in every situation and circumstance whether or not they are going to operate in the flesh or in the Spirit. This is the internal struggle within every saved member of the body of Christ according to Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. Right? For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and the two are contrary to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye want. Would. Okay? The fact is, that as believers, we do deny Christ in the details of our lives by choosing to sow to the flesh instead of walking in the Spirit on the basis of a renewed mind. It's a fact that believers do to varying degrees at different times deny Christ through our works. While it is a fact that we are perfect and sinless positionally in the Lord Jesus Christ, it is also a fact that our current standing does not always line up with our state in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? If the third... If the third if statement of the faithful saying of 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 through 13, I said that wrong. If the if statement of the faithful saying states as a matter of fact what all honest believers will readily admit, we cease to be Christ's workmanship when we choose to follow our own way in terms of thoughts, attitudes, and actions. Christ is denied his rightful place in our lives as believers when we function in a manner that is unbecoming of the doctrine. That guy in 1 Timothy 5.8, why is he worse than an infidel? 
Because what he's doing is not in line with what he says he believes. Okay? If I'm up here talking about grace, 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 and I go home and i got a big law hammer, and I'm lowering the boom on every member of my family every time they upset me or get out of line, I'm saying one thing and doing what? Another. Christ is denied His rightful place in our lives as believers when we function in a manner that is unbecoming of the doctrine. Yet... We all do so from time to time in the details of our daily lives. This is the function of the third if statement. To factually state what we all know to be true. All believers deny Christ from time to time through our works. Now look at the verse. If we suffer we shall also reign with Him. If we deny Him, He also will deny us. Folks, will you reign with Christ? Yes. You cannot be a member of the body of Christ and not reign with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let's also be clear. Your specific function in Christ's reign in the heavenly places, is it determined by or at the judgment seat of Christ? Yes. You will reign, whether you will reign as a throne, a dominion, a principality, a power, or in every name that is named, which is a position of authority, as we established last week, will be determined by the outcome where? At the judgment seat. But even if you suffer great loss, and much of your work is consumed in the fire, or what have you, are you still in Christ? Is Christ still in you? Are you still a member of the body of Christ? And if you are a member of Christ's body, you will reign with Christ. The specific, I'll say it again, the specific function that you will have in the heavenly government is determined at the judgment seat. But this second half of verse 12, if we deny Him, He also will deny us, should not be mixed with the first half of verse 12 to say the following. If we suffer, we shall reign with Him. If we deny Him, He shall also deny us. Well, If we deny Him, that means we choose not to suffer. That's how we deny Him, is we choose not to suffer with Him. We choose not, we don't say with Him, by the way, but we choose not to suffer, and so if we choose not to suffer, He'll deny us, and what He's denying you is a reign. No, you will reign with Christ. Okay? Again, your specific function will be determined where? At the judgment seat of Christ. But if you're a member of Christ's body, there is no way, shape, manner, or form that you won't reign with your head, the Lord Jesus Christ. So that tells us what? That tells us that our service, that our conduct, that to the degree that we yield ourselves, know, reckon, and yield ourselves to those truths in Romans 6, and allow and allow ourselves to be Christ's workmanship is the degree to which the reward will be bestowed. Does that make sense? You will reign with Christ. I will reign with Christ. If you're a member of the body of Christ, you will. What you do, specifically, is determined at the judgment seat. Now, i, I got one thing I want to say. I think we pretty well covered this. Verse 12, but there's one message I want to preach the next time I'm with you in two weeks on some more details about what it means to reign. Because people got a lot of misconceptions about this. Okay? Somebody says, well, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a throne, man. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out there and I'm going to do it in such a way that I can be a throne. What's the problem there? How many times did I say I? 
Okay? Yes, you will reign with Christ, folks, but I believe there to be, I believe that there's a fundamental misconception there, and I'm going to set the table for two weeks from now so that you'll make sure you're here, and that's this. You and I, when we see that word reign, we, we automatically think about authoritarian governmental reign and being able to boss people around and tell them what to do, don't we? Yeah, you do, I do. Do you remember in the Lord's earthly ministry, the apostles are arguing about who's going to be greatest in the kingdom? And what does he say to them? He says that the Gentiles exercise authority over men, but so shall it not be among you. But the greatest among you is going to be the one that is servant These positions of authority are not positions of dictatorial power to lord over people. They're positions of greater service capacity that are determined at the judgment seat by the service that you render here. It's not about, ha I'm going to be a principality and Craig's just going to be a power. Poor Craig, poor Craig, if he had suffered as much as I did and did this as much as me and that as much as me and, and, you know, held for, well, you know, he could have, he could be a throne. That's not what this is about. This is about you and I serving the Lord Jesus Christ and that fire contesting that service capacity of your work. And in the end, the reward is given not based upon whether you're going to be a, bi- a big, big cheese to boss everyone around, but it's how did you serve. And I will tell you right now, I firmly believe that a lot of people that you look at outwardly and you think, man, they're going to be big time, are going to end up being nothing. Not nothing, but not, not you know, I said that wrong. I didn't mean nothing. And those who seem... What, what does Paul say about the member of the body in 1 first, in first Corinthians 12 that seems to be unnecessary? He says, upon that member we bestow the more abundant honor. Interesting thought. You will reign with Christ. You do deny Him. I deny Him. We all deny Him. Through our work. And how that all comes out in the end, at the judgment seat, will determine what position you have in the heavenly government. All of them are positions of authority because you're a member of Christ's body and the Godhead formed the body of Christ to reign in the heavens. Heavenly Father, thank you once again for your word. Great for the saints that are gathered here this morning. We pray that as many leave from this place to go on trips and stuff for Memorial Day weekend next weekend that that we will never be far away in our minds and hearts from the Word of God. We're grateful for this opportunity that we've had this morning to preach and um, to edify the saints with, with your Word. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.